Hey, Professor, how are you? Okay, uh, another exciting week. Um, but the most important thing, I think, this past week has been the uh, uh, new developments in, in, uh, in Europe about uh, defending their borders. Uh -huh. uh, it's really quite amusing, I think, that um, the whole idea of restricting people's access across borders really didn't begin until less than 100 years ago. Because I remember that Norman Douglas, who was uh, writing novels uh, while he was going back and forth between England and Italy in the, the decade after the First World War, uh, complained that he had to get a passport in order to keep traveling, I think in 1922. So it's not as hundred years yet since people have needed passports to cross borders. Right. No, that's true. And, uh, and uh, for a long time, uh, you've needed not only a passport, but in many cases, most cases, a visa as well in order mm -hmm. to cross borders. Permission from your government and theirs. Mm -hmm. um, and it worked quite well, I think. Uh, uh, well, and then, of course, they controlled how much money you took across the borders uh, after the Second World War. Um, but uh, recently, it's, uh, a lot of countries have had, begun to have great difficulty in controlling their borders and stopping people coming across. Uh, and it's always amazed me since the migration problem began, the refugee problem began in Europe. Um, I'm not sure how long ago it was now, but certainly over a year, um, that uh, nobody addressed it from that point of view. They, it was all a question of do we accept the refugees or don't we accept the refugees. Nobody said anything about, well, do they have a visa or not? <laughs> right, right. Uh, and now the uh, European Commission is saying, uh, well, if, you, if the countries themselves can't defend their borders, we'll have to defend them in their name, in the name of the Union. And that's really surprising to me because... Uh, uh, we've noticed that countries have gradually beginning have begun to fail to control their borders, and it, so in a way, it's almost a step backwards for the European Union to say, "Okay, we're going to hold on to borders." Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, that they're talking about, still talking about increasing uh, the membership of the Union. Are they are they talking about uh, increased policing of borders? within the Union or the borders at the uh, perimeters of the Union? They're trying to avoid policing the borders within the Union by increasing the, the Union border responsibility border. for uh, policing the borders around the Union. I see. Okay. All right. Well, th this, whole, this whole border idea of, of um, trying to prevent the, the, the free movement of human mm -hmm. beings um, I hate to say it, but it's almost been superseded by globalization in some respects. Um, I mean, a, a person may physically be sitting in Princeton or in Philadelphia, but he or she can virtually be anywhere. Uh, more importantly, his or her money uh, can be anywhere. And one of the things uh, that occurred actually just this past two weeks, I noticed an article in the Reinsurance Trade Press where the, the Thai Council of Insurance from Thailand uh, ventured publicly to guess that uh, the Thai insurance industry was going to be indirectly affected this year because of expected reduced demand for Thai goods from France as a result of the Paris terror attacks. Now that's a little bit of, of strained logic, I, I, <laughs> I, I must confess. I, I was like, really? How did they come to that? But, but then a couple of other things came, came up uh, as well. There was some very severe flooding in, in Chennai, India, as you know. Some 300 people or so lost their lives. Um, uh, there was initially some very big concern in the reinsurance industry because companies such as Ford, uh, Gambler, Benz, uh, Fiat, Hyundai, uh, the, the roster is quite impressive. Uh, foreign companies have manufacturing plants or, or subsidiary component manufacturing plants there. And people were aghast uh, at the prospective business interruption claims that might be forthcoming as a result of the flooding. And of course, the only benchmark that people had was in 2011 when the floods inundated Thailand around Bangkok 
And at first, everybody was watching on television, seeing the awful human tragedy unfold. There were 800 people dead. And it was only after the water reached the industrial estates, these office parks, in which are located tens of thousands of small companies that are suppliers to the global silicon chip industry and the global automotive industry, that production lines in the United States and in Japan and in Korea were shut down and the business interruption bill that the reinsurance industry has to pay for those Thai floods is $15 billion. And nobody knew that they were there because cat modeling for, for parts of Asia is notoriously sketchy. And apparently it doesn't necessarily keep up with, with tenancy frequencies as the companies move and, and move into new offices. So there was a real collective breath holding in India People were wondering, oh my God, what's this bill going to be? And some of the early uh, predictions were multi-billion dollars. But as it turns out, the industry dodged a bullet. It's only going to be about $300 million. Hmm. And then the, the last component, the last component, just as an aside, was in, uh, in Cumbria, in Britain. There was something called Storm Desmond that hit Britain mm -hmm. two weekends ago. And a uh, big event, flooding heavy rain, deluge, and it categorized itself as a, a one in 100 year event, according to the catastrophe models that the insurance industry uses to base premium on. The only difficulty was that this was the second time in nine years that a storm <laughs> of the same strength that hit that exact same area. So a woman named, uh, her last name is Judd, J-U-D-D. Mm -hmm. She's the UK Minister of Environment and Meteorological Services publicly set, seized upon by all the British papers, this is a first, a government official, she conceded that the likely cause of the second flood in such a short period of time was climate change. So it was like, whoa, there it is, right there, underline that five times. So, but I guess what I'm trying to say is you have all these people in, these, in Brussels that are trying to figure out how they're going to police the borders, and meanwhile, industry is already cross-border in a very big way. Yeah, yeah. And not only is the manufacturing industry, but following behind that are the insurers trying to make sure that when events happen, claims are gonna be paid. So stockholders who are multinational around the world who own parts of these insurance companies are gonna be made whole. So, I mean, it's a little crazy to me. I mean, these, 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 they're so far behind the times trying to catch up with what de facto exists it's like trying to uh, legislate de jure uh, policies when, in fact, the reality is far, far ahead of where they are. Well, I think that uh, we're, we're just seeing more of the sort of phenomenon that we keep talking about, which is that uh, some people are welcoming the new things that are coming and making, working out ways to adapt them, like Merkel. Other people are trying to hold on to the way things were in the past and prevent things changing. And that is happening more and more as the rate of change increases. Um, although I'm not sure um, whose idea it was to police the borders of Europe, and that may have actually been Merkel's idea as a, as a, a political strategy to stop people complaining about what was going on inside. Possibly. Um, I'm not sure. But the, the once in a hundred years phenomenon, um, it seems to me that in order to decide whether that's climate change or not, we have to know what the record of the once in a hundred year <laughs> phenomena have been because right. maybe the last hundred years finished between the two events. Yeah, m models are always a little bit uh, a leap of faith, uh, yeah. but you'd be surprised. I mean, the, the industry puts an awful lot of stock in them and uh, they basically... Well, it, it, obviously everything has to be done uh, on, on the basis of some sort of statistic and... Correct. Uh, statistics, even though uh, they're numbers and we have tremendous faith in numbers, in fact, uh, you can argue anything with statistics if you're a clever statistician. Mm -hmm. But the, th the thing that struck me particularly about the situation in India with the flooding was, I mean, there's, there's all this byplay and it was going on at the same time as the climate change conference in, uh, in Paris. I mean, Modi, of course, is, is the leader of the, the, the group that's basically telling the West, hey, look, you know, what about us? I mean, you guys industrialized already and you polluted the planet. Now you're going to leave us in poverty. That's not going to work. And meanwhile, what's happening right in his backyard is, again, events have outstripped where he is. 
there is industry, there are investments, and there are an international community that's getting ready with their checkbooks to begin to underwrite the losses because they've received premium payments from the businesses that are in that area. Yeah. And, you know, I, I guess what I don't understand is, uh, I mean, it, it, it's sometimes on a, on a global scale when, when you look at what's going on financially. Um, if you were to go into uh, a C-suite office of, of one of these companies that's involved in, in a huge global operation and start talking about globalization, they would cut you off. They would say, that's old news. I mean, that's what our company's built on now. That's what has been built on for the past 10 years, 15 years. And it's a question of governments catching up with it. And I don't. They're, I think they're way behind the curve, as you've often said. Uh, Modi, I think, has been a great disappointment uh, because everybody thought he was going to be the imaginative leader that India desperately needs. But what's happening in India is that, uh, uh, I mean, India is comparable to China in so many ways because their populations have grown at the same rate in the last 50 odd years. Uh, but and China is doing very well economically and India is not doing anywhere near so well. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's not changing socially, it's not urbanizing as fast as China is. And the national infrastructure uh, has had relatively little investment anywhere in India. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean there are a few parts of India where there are new roads but it's not all over the country by any means. It's basically the British infrastructure still. Um, but the, the big corporations are managing their own infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So the big corporations are leading uh, uh, India's social change. Yeah, but India still has something that China does not have. They, they have the rule of law that uh, is still the British rule of law largely. And uh, that's not the same in China. I'll tell you an interesting anecdote. Well, I know there's a problems in China, which we'll come back to in a minute, but I just wanted to say that uh, the, pr the problem India has the same problem with its rule of law as it does with its infrastructure. It's not keeping up with the way things are changing. And uh, even though it still has this reputation of the world's largest democracy, mm -hmm. isn't that wonderful? But the democracy isn't working. Right. Because right. It's right. because the country has still not become nationally integrated. Mm -hmm. but anyway, is, I, is, is, that, is that ever going to be possible in India? It's so disparate. If it can be done, if it can be done in China, in a country that's almost the size of the United States, uh, in India, which is a fraction of the size of China, I'm not sure what the percentage is, but it can't be, must be less than half the size of China, what, I think. Population-wise? But popular, yes, but the thing is, the population is is not anywhere near so uh, widely dispersed. As oh, right. You mean ge geographically, yes. Yeah. Ge geographically, in, ter in spatial terms, it's much more, much closer together, so right. it should be much easier for it to become nationally integrated. Right, right. But the, the, it has a cultural history that is making that very difficult. Mm. It is changing, but nowhere near uh, as fast as it needs to change. Well, there is a, uh, there's a company that's traded on uh, the London and uh, Hong Kong stock exchanges called Foshun International, F-O-S-U-N, and the founder and CEO and chairman of the company uh, is one person. His first name is Guo, G-U-O, I can't pronounce his last name. He's a, a well-known uh, uh, figure in the insurance reinsurance industry because about 50% of Foshin International's investments are in uh, insurance and reinsurance uh, in both Bermuda and in London. Um, he's a self-professed uh, follower of Warren Buffett and uh, over the weekend uh, he was taken off an airplane in Hong Kong that was bound for Shanghai by the Chinese police. And he disappeared for 72 hours. I heard. And the stock plummeted. The insurance companies that he was the head of were like, we don't know. Uh, his number two in command said, we haven't heard. Uh, and then the fellow finally popped up again at a, at a company meeting that was scheduled, received a standing, in, uh, standing ovation. And apparently it's nothing to do with the, the company they're investigating. It's personal financial irregularities they're looking at. <laughs> uh, um, no, China has been in the news recently for several uh, um, things that are sort of uh, eye-catching, but n n it's not quite clear how one should interpret them. No, it has to do with, uh, with again, the, the, the national system, which is 
Um, uh, whereas in India, it, we has, it has this reputation of being a wonderful democracy, and so everything is evaluated in those terms, and a lot of things are overlooked because it's a democracy. In China, it's the other way around, that nothing is overlooked because it's not a democracy, and yeah. so if things aren't the way we like them, there must be, so, this must be something wrong with the system. But the system is gradually changing all the time, and we don't, from the outside, quite understand how it is, is changing. But certainly, the Chinese are getting things done, and the Indians aren't. No, you're right. And I mean, I, I'm probably a little bit, at times, too harsh on the Chinese, but uh, I, I agree with you. So, well, Professor, this has been a very enjoyable uh, session, and I, I wish you and your family the best for uh, the Christmas holiday. That's right. We probably won't meet next week. Uh, so I'll see you in the new year. Well, maybe we'll meet in the uh, that interregnum between the, the two holidays. One never knows. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much.